Hi everyone, welcome to this session which is on the topic of Flex Algo and BGP Class 4 Transport. My name is Julian Bluchek. So before we talk about the main part of the um, talk, here's a overview of the segment routing landscape. As you know, segment routing has been around for about eight years now in terms of IETF drafts, and it's been deployed in many networks um, worldwide. Now, if you look at the main branches of this um, layout, then one of the branches on the right-hand side is traffic engineering, and people can do segment routing um, traffic engineering using distributed TE, but nowadays people increasingly are using central controllers, and that lends itself very much to um, self-driving networks, things like automated congestion avoidance, automated um, self-healing, and automated egress peering engineering. And then the other branch on the left-hand side is shortest path routing. And people often um, use SR as a vehicle for migrating away from LDP using the SR version of shortest path routing. And also an aspect of shortest path routing is FlexAlgo, which we'll be talking about a lot during this um, session. And then BGP class four transport, that's another topic for today, but it's not in this diagram because this diagram is talking more about what happens within a given do domain. Well, BGP class four transport is talking about how we glue um, different domains um, together. So with that, I'll go on to the um, first of the um, topics I'm gonna cover, which is applications of um, FlexAlgo. And what I'll be talking about in particular is the applications and use cases of FlexAlgo. If you want to know more about the underlying protocol machinery, how FlexAlgo definitions are communicated using the IGP, then I'd refer you to Shraddha's talk from Nanog81. So let's have a look at this first example of um, FlexAlgo. And so what we've got is a topology where I'm assuming that the metrics are the same on each um, link within the topology. And we've got the normal IGP topology, which I call the um, gray topology. And all of the nodes in the diagram are members of that. And then we have two flex algos set up in this network. We have the blue flex algo, um, the routers on the top part of the diagram are members of that. And then you've got the other routers, which are members of the um, red um, flex algo. And from the um, SID point of view, um, each node will have a different um, node SID for each um, topology that it's a member of. And so by way of example, we can look at PE3, and it's a member of the default gray topology, and so there's a SID associated with that, the value 3003 um, in this example. And then it's a member of the blue flex algo, and so it's got a SID associated with that, with a value 1003. And both of those are associated with its loopback address, which you can see is 10.0.0.3. Then in a similar vein, PE4, that's a member of the default gray topology, and its SID associated with that is 3004. And then it's a member of the red flex algo, and so it has a SID associated with that, which is 2004. And all of the information necessary for the other nodes to know these SID values is communicated via IGP extensions. And so all of the nodes in the network will know these um, different SID values. And each of these nodes will also have um, different SID values as well, but they're just not shown in the diagram for reasons of clarity. And then what happens is that each node performs separate SPF calculations, shortest path first calculations, um, for each um, topology that it's a member of. And so if you take PE1 as an example, it's doing one set of SPF calculations as a consequence of its membership of the gray topology and a completely separate set of SPF calculations as a consequence of its membership of the blue um, flex algo. And in general, um, or at least sometimes, the outcomes of those calculations could be um, different because the topologies are different. So now we can look at an example of um, sending traffic across these various um, topologies. So first of all, let's have a look at an example where PE1 wants to send traffic using the, the vanilla gray topology. So, you know, we're not too fussed about what path this traffic takes across the network. Um, and so PE1 um, launching traffic into this gray topology uses the um, node SID 
associated with the destination node, which for the great apology um, is 3003, as you can see here. And so PE1, when it did its SPF calculations in the context of the gray um, topology, um, realized that it has two um, shortest path neighbors towards destination PE3, those being P1 and P2. And so it ECMPs the traffic across those um, two next hops. Likewise, P2 can see P3 and P4 as um, next neighbors, as does P1, and so the ECMP across P3 and P4. And so you can see the traffic makes its way from PE1 to PE3 across the network using these various ECMP um, paths. So that's for the vanilla traffic. Now, in contrast, we can look at what happens if we launch traffic onto a flex algo. And so in this example, PE1 wants to send some other traffic to PE3, but it wants it to be confined to the blue um, flex algo. So what it does is to put onto the packets the SID associated with um, PE3's membership of the blue flex algo, 1003. Now, when PE1 did its um, SPF calculations in the context of the blue um, flex algo, it realized that its um, only um, viable next top neighbor was P1 because P2 isn't even a member of the blue flex algo. So that would have been automatically um, discounted. And so PE1 sends the traffic only to P1. And P1 <clears throat> in turn um, realizes that only P3 is the um, next hop neighbor towards PE3 and sends it only to P3. And so in that way, it makes its way horizontally across the diagram to PE3. In a similar vein, um, PE2 wants to send traffic to um, PE4 um, using only the red flex algo. And so it puts on the um, SID value associated with PE4's um, loopback address, 2004, um, sends the traffic to P2 only because that's the only viable neighbor in the context of the red flex algo. And so in that way, it makes its way to PE4 as shown by those red arrows. And so in fact, this slide illustrates the very first use case of flex algo um, when flex algo was first invented, which was to um, achieve plane enforcement in a network where you've got two planes, you put each plane into a different flex algo. And if you want to define, or if you want to confine traffic to a particular plane, um, you make sure you launch it into the corresponding um, flex algo. And that means there's no way that it can jump across um, one of those diagonal crosslinks to the other plane. So this is very good for high availability services where you're um, deliberately sending duplicate traffic in a live live fashion across the network. This is often used for um, financial market data or broadcast um, videos. So it's a very neat application of um, flex algo. Now, in this example, um, each node was a member of only one flex algo in addition to the um, you know, default gray topology. But of course, in general, a node could be a member of multiple flex algos. So here's another example. So you can see the physical topology shown in gray on the top half of the slide. If you look at the red flex algo on the bottom right, you can see that only a subset of nodes and links are members of it. And so, um, for example, P5 is not a member of the um, red flex algo, while it is a member of the blue flex algo. On the other hand, some of the other nodes, P1, P2, P3, and P4, are members of both of the um, flex algos. And some of the links are members of both flex algos, and some are members of only um, one of the flex algos you can see. And so in general, with flex algo, you can um, have a subset of nodes and links being members of that particular um, flex algo according to your particular needs. So now we're in a position where we can look at another example. Um, in some cases, um, you might have um, different types of traffic using your common network infrastructure. And those different traffic types might have different goals in terms of what type of metric um, they need. Um, a classic example is where you've got some delay sensitive traffic. And for that, you'd want to use a metric proportional to the latency of the um, link. On the other hand, for things like bulk internet traffic, you want the cheapest cost path, which typically is um, accordance to the bandwidth of the link. So you want a metric inversely proportional to the bandwidth of the link. And so if you're um, perhaps merging networks, um, you know, these two requirements might um, conflict. You know, with a single IGP topology, you can't set a metric on each link in such a way that it satisfies both of these um, different styles of um, traffic. And so this is where flex algo can help a lot. And so in this diagram, we've got um, a network. 
and we've got these two different types of traffic. And what's happening is that the um, bulk internet traffic, which we want to try to make use um, the high bandwidth links, um, that's mapped onto the default IGP um, topology. And that um, is actually um, subjected to the metrics shown in the blue colored font. Um, if you look at the diagram, you can see that the high bandwidth links are shown with thicker lines. And those are the diagonal links across the core of the network, while the horizontal and vertical links have um, lower bandwidth. On the other hand, we want um, delay sensitive traffic to follow the shortest possible um, path. And so we map that onto the red flex algo in this example. And the red flex algo has metrics shown in this um, red colored font. And so that means that, um, in fact, those two different types of traffic being mapped to different topologies with different metrics actually tend to follow different paths through the network, which is exactly what we want. And so if you look here, um, the traffic that's um, the, the latency sensitive traffic, which is following the um, flex algo um, shown in red, that passes straight across the top of the network, P1, P1, P2, P3 while the bulk internet traffic, which we wanted to follow the high bandwidth links, follows this other path via P5 across the core of the network. And so as you can see, um, FlexAlgo is giving us this extra degree of freedom, allowing us to map certain traffic to that FlexAlgo um, such that it can um, benefit from a different IGP metric um, setup. And in general, you can um, you know, choose what um, style of metric you want for a given flex algo. And so in this um, example, this particular flex algo has been defined um, such that it uses a um, delay metric. And that delay metric can be either statically set if the delay of a given link isn't expected to change much, or in fact, it can be a dynamically changing metric according to um, TWAMP measurements. And so the IGP neighbors are sending timestamp um, probe packets to each other, and that um, determines the um, latency of the link, and that's fed into the metric value that's advertised via the um, IGP flooding for that particular link. And so that can change as a function of time according to different metric conditions. In general, um, you can map a flex algo to use either a delay metric or a TE metric or a normal IGP metric according to your requirements. And that gives you enough degrees of freedom normally to be able to have different topologies um, with different styles of metric um, sharing the same physical um, topology. Now, I've been saying a lot about flex algo and um, I've been saying, yeah, we map this sort of traffic to that flex algo and so on. Um, but I haven't said specifically how you actually achieve that mapping. So that's what I want to talk about next. And so, in fact, the way we do this is using the property called colors. And so a flex algo is given a particular color, which enables um, mapping of traffic to it. In a similar vein, actually, um, it's not only used flex algo. So TE tunnels, whether they're SRTE or RSVP tunnels, can be given a color um, to facilitate mapping of particular traffic to those as well. Also, as we'll see later on, um, towards the end of the talk, it's used again in BGP classical transports. So we'll meet colors again when we get to um, that part of the um, session. So let's have a look in more detail about how this auto mapping is working on the basis of um, colors. And so in the example, um, we've got a network. We're not showing the core routers. Um, we've got two flex algos in use. We've got the red one, which um, has color 100 um, ascribed to it. And we've got the blue one, which has got color 200 ascribed to it. And PEY has advertised um, various prefixes to PEX via um, BGP. Um, those actually are tagged with color communities. And so, for example, 10.1 and 10.2 slash 16 have color community 100, while 11.1 and 11.2 slash 16 have color community um, 200. And these could be plain um, internet prefixes or could be VPN um, prefixes. And so what PEX does is if it needs to send traffic to PEY, perhaps um, um, a destination within that subnet 10.1 slash 16, because that prefix has got color community 100 attached to it, PEX automatically launches the traffic onto the flex algo that also has color 100. So that traffic's launched onto the red flex algo, while traffic um, within the prefix, let's say 11.1 slash 16, 
that's got Color Community 200 um, attached to it. And so that gets automatically mapped onto the blue flex algorithm because that's got color 200. So as you can see, the colors are a convenient way of auto mapping. Um, traffic with a given color community is mapped onto the transport that's got that same color. So with that, we can look at a more elaborate example, again, using FlexAlgo. And in this case, we're using FlexAlgo within this transport network in the center of the diagram, but also you've got some um, data centers. And so on the left-hand side, you've got a regional data center, on the right-hand side, an edge data center. This could be in a 5G deployment, for example. And then you've got overlay networks. So you've got um, these overlays residing on um, compute resources within these data centers. Um, these can be um, containerized network functions, um, hosting things like distributed units and centralized units in a 5G ORAN deployment. And so each of um, these um, colored blobs represents a different slice, a different you know, tenant on this um, 5G network. And each slice, um, by the nature of the traffic it's carrying, um, has different transport um, requirements. And so in particular, in this example, traffic from the green and purple slices need minimum cost transport once they reach the core, the minimum monetary cost um, transport, which is the blue flex algo, while traffic from the yellow slice um, that's carrying latency sensitive traffic. And so that needs to be mapped onto the um, red flex algo once the traffic hits the um, transport network. And so the way we achieve this is by using color communities, which I'll show in more detail in the next slide. And then typically the data centers are, um, you know, um, Ethernet, sorry, the Ethernet switches, um, you know, IP forwarding, spine and leaf arrangement typically, um, lots of ECMP. And so typically people don't want to extend the um, transport like Flexago into the data centers. They're just doing plain IP um, forwarding. And so what you'll have is an MPLS over UDP tunnel carrying, um, you know, layer three VPN labeled packets um, across the spine and leaf to the DC gateway. So it's the DC gateway that's doing the mapping into the correct transport on the basis of color community. And so we can zoom in and look at how that's working in more detail in this slide. So this is a cross section through that same network where um, that data center on the right hand side, we're zooming in on one compute resource. We're zooming in on um, the um, green um, virtual overlay network. And what you've got typically on the compute resources is um, a virtual router, a software-based router, which has um, separate VRFs for each um, slice. Um, so we've got the green VRF highlighted here, and you've got these containerized network functions, um, which act as CEs from this um, you know, layer three VPN point of view. So they're the CEs from the point of view of this green VRF. And what you'll have is advertised using BGP is the prefixes pertaining to these containerized network functions. So here in the example, we've got the prefix associated with CNF2. And so you've got a layer three VPN label highlighted here, V2. You've got normal route target associated with the um, VPN. And then very importantly, the color community um, 200 in the example. And normally this um, advertisement is mediated by an SDN controller um, that's controlling the cloud overlay and the associated routing. And so it's going to be advertising that prefix via BGP to the local DC gateway. And that in turn will advertise it to other DC gateways in the network. And then finally, that prefix arrives in the green VRF on the left-hand side. And in so doing, the BGP next hop is changing each time you hit a DC gateway. And so suppose now in the forwarding plane, we have a packet which is actually um, being sent by CNF1 on the left-hand side, its destination IP address is um, that associated with CNF2 on the right-hand side. And so um, in the green VRF is the BGP advertisement that had been sent across the network from um, right to left. And so from the point of view of that green VRF on vRouter1, um, the BGP next stop at that point is the local DC gateway, DC gateway number one. And so what um, will happen is that um, onto the IP packet will be put the um, layer three VPN label, which at this point is value V2 um, double prime, and the packet will be placed onto the MPLS of UDP tunnel that um, goes from vRouter1 to the local DC gateway, DC gateway number one. And you'll have the VPN label V2 double prime, as you can see, and then UDP header on top. Packet arrives at DC gateway one, it will remove the UDP encapsulation. It sees this label V2 double prime, 
And so it knows that the BGP next top for that is DC gateway number two. Because the BGP um, route had a color community 200, that triggers DC gateway one to put the packet onto the color 200 transport. This might be a flex algo, it might be an SRTE LSP, the one with color 200. And so um, the packet's launched with the um, label or labels associated with that transport, um, the um, VPN um, label as well, shown in green. And so in that way, the packet arrives at DC Gateway 2. Um, DC Gateway 2 does a lookup on that label and puts the packet into the MPLS ODB tunnel, but terminates at vRouter 2. It's sent to the green VRF and to the destination CNF2. And so overall, you can see in a nutshell that simply by adding the correct color community to the um, prefix, um, that triggers um, DC Gateway 1 to um, launch the packet onto the correct transport, onto the correct um, flex algo, for example. So you can see the color community mapping providing this convenient mechanism of ensuring that we're using the right um, transport, even if the start of that transport is you know, multiple hops away from where the traffic originated, way back here on the compute resource in this data center on the left-hand side. So with that, what I'd like to do is to talk about the um, final topic of today, which is BGP Class 4 Transport, or BGP-CT for short. And first of all, let's have a look at the problem statement underpinning this. And so now we've got a setup, we've got multiple ASs, we've got PE1 on the left-hand side, and it wants to send traffic to PE2, which is several ASs away on the right-hand side of the um, diagram. And in each AS, we've got um, colored transport, we've got color 100 transport and color 200 um, transport, where color 100 is cheapest cost and color 200 is minimum latency. Now, um, the thing is, um, this is the problem statement. Um, when traffic goes from ASBR1 to ASBR2, how does ASBR2 know what colored transport is supposed to use for this um, traffic which originated back here on PE1. If we're using BGPLU between the ASs, which is typically used, BGPLU does not have any color awareness. And so there's no way of conveying to ASBR2, um, you know, this, the desire to use, let's say, color 200 um, for the um, packet's journey. So this is where BGP classful transport comes in. And so what that enables you to do is to actually extend the color mapping across multiple ASs or other types of domain um, in such a way that you're not having to expose the internal topology of a domain um, to any other domain. And like um, as a consequence of this, each domain can make its own choice of transport technology independent of what the other domains are doing. So one domain might be using a flex algo um, setup, and another one might be using SRTE, and another one might be using RSVP um, TE. And that's perfectly fine. And regardless of what they've chosen to do, um, BGP CT acts as the glue um, between those um, domains. Now, um, as such, it's a very useful extension to BGP labeled Unicast, BGPLU. I mean, BGPLU has proven to be a very popular way of scaling networks. Um, people just use BGPLU between domains and no IGP or anything like that, um, attempting to cross domains. Um, sometimes this is called seamless MPLS, and it's quite um, widespread nowadays in terms of the um, deployments. And so BGPCT is very similar in spirit to BGPLU, except that it's got egress PE color, comma, um, color um, granularity rather than just egress PE um, granularity. And so BGPCT is a very good upgrade to BGPLU um, in order to support color aware transport. And so we can look at how this works. So to give a concrete example, um, we've got these two different colors of transport in use. And so PE2 associated with its loopback address will be two different labels, one corresponding to color 100, the other corresponding to color 200. And those um, you know, percolate via BGP um, as shown by those dashed green um, lines um, hopping from ASBR to ASBR across the network. The ASBRs are gonna be changing next top to self, which will change the label value um, as well, but that's fine. At the end of the day, PE1 um, sees two different label values um, for PE2, um, one corresponding to color 100, the other corresponding to color 200. From PE1's point of view, the BGP next top is ASBR1. So let's suppose it wants to send traffic to PE1. Um, it will have received um, you know, service level prefixes from PE2, perhaps VPN prefixes with color 200. 
And so in, to ensure that those do use um, the Color 200 transport, P1, first of all, puts onto the packet the um, layer three VPN label, and then the um, BGP CT label associated with Color 200, um, associated with PE2's loopback address. And then finally, labels associated with the local transport, which might be Flexargo, might be SRTE, might be RSVP, TE, um, terminating at ASPR1. ASPR1 um, hands over the packet. Um, at this point, the top label will be the BGP CT label. ASPR2 sees that, knows that it's associated with color 200, and so uses the color 200 transport to reach ASPR3. Similarly, color 200 will be used for this final AS hop. And so the packet consistently, um, as it travels between ASs and across ASs, will be using color 200 um, transports. Finally, let's have a look at um, some of the um, nuts and bolts behind BGP um, CT. And so there's a new SAFI defined for it, um, regardless of whether you're talking about IP version 4 or IP version 6, the SAFI value is going to be 76. Because we are advertising the same address um, with different um, you know, attributes, we need to disambiguate those two um, versions of that prefix. And so route distinguishers are used to achieve that. And then you've got um, the label value. Um, this is for the, um, you know, red, um, you know, the color 100 transport, and then a different label value L2 for the color 200 transport. And in order to um, convey the actual color, um, there's a new flavor of route target um, called the transport target, um, and the color is embedded within that. So that's a, you know, flavor of how the BGP CT, um, you know, modifies B, um, BGP to um, carry this type of color information. So that brings me to the end. Finally, some references for um, further reading. Um, but thank you for your attention. And now we're open for questions. Well, Julian, thank you for presenting and uh, for joining us for this uh, Q&A session. And the first question from our community is, um, it's all fun, uh, uh, everything works great, but at some point things break. Um, um, specific to Flex Algo, what operational tools are available for troubleshooting? Right, yeah, it's a good question actually. So, um, first of all, there are CLI commands where you can, you know, visualize, um, you know, membership of a Flex Algo and, you know, what metric is associated with a Flex Algo. You can see what other nodes um, are members of a Flex Algo, you know, when you're looking on the CLI of one router. But then um, another aspect which is very useful is that um, BGPLS has um, extensions for FlexAlgo. So BGPLS is the method whereby the topology of a network is reported to a um, central um, controller, and then the user can um, visualize aspects of the topology, you know, at the controller level. So BGPLS has been used for quite a few years, you know, just for reporting the, um, you know, topology of a network and um, attributes of links, such as the bandwidth of a link. And so with the um, FlexAlgo extensions to BGPLS, the controller knows um, what the FlexAlgo membership is, you know, which nodes and links are members of a given FlexAlgo. And then it can provide um, visualization on that basis, um, you know, to the user in a graphical um, form, or it can, um, you know, have a northbound REST API to, you know, report to, you know, an orchestrate or something like that, if that's interested in what's going on at the Flex Algo level. So the BGPLS extensions are very useful ingredients as well for the visualization. Gotcha. Thank you. Our next question is, uh, how different is uh, BGP class for transport uh, compared to BGP SRTE? Yeah, they're quite different beasts, I would say, because um, SRTE is, you know, very much, you know, traffic engineering and furthermore, controller driven. So the usual model is that you've got controller, you know, computing a TE path, um, you know, across a network, and then it imposes that path onto the ingress router by, you know, communicating it using the, you know, SRT extensions for, um, you know, BGP. So it's traffic engineering orientated. Um, BGP CT is more um, a case of providing glue um, between different um, domains. Um, with color um, awareness, furthermore, um, you know, for that um, glue when you're sending traffic from one domain um, to another. Um, I mean, whether or not an individual domain uses traffic engineering or not um, is up to you. And as I mentioned, 
um, you know, people can make independent choices. So domain one might be just using shortest path routing with FlexAlgo. Another domain might be using, you know, traffic engineering and um, so on. So they're somewhat, you know, independent of each other, I would say, the BGP SRT and the BGP um, CT. Gotcha. Thank you. Our next question is, uh, could IBGP class would transport to be used to add color awareness in an IBGP LU network? And for example, add color awareness without segment routing? Oh, that's a good question, actually. Um, I should have said, because, um, you know, colors are not necessarily um, associated with segment routing um, per se. And so, in fact, we recently added color awareness to RSVP. So you can um, create um, various RSVP TE LSPs and give, um, you know, different colors um, to them. And so in a BGP CT um, deployment, um, actually, you know, you could have RSVP in one or more domains. You could have SRT in other domains, as I mentioned, Flexago in um, further um, domains. And regardless of what people are doing within each domain, um, you know, BGP CT is providing the um, glue with color awareness, you know, between those um, domains, yes. Yeah. So RSVP um, coloring is something that we added actually in the um, most recent release. I mean, people are interested in implementations. Actually, BGPCT we added to um, JUNOS 21.1 and also RSVP color awareness at the same time, in fact. Got it. Um, in your uh, BGP uh, class for transport um, part of the presentation, you were referencing. Uh, uh, different autonomous systems, were they all uh, within a confederation managed by the same organization, or perhaps they were across uh, NNI, connected to a via NNI, or they were kind of independent autonomous systems? Oh, right, right, sure. Um, yeah, not confederation in the sort of BGP confederation sense, but I, I know what you mean, like belonging to the same, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, operator. Um, in the main, that would be the typical case, like it has been for BGPLU. So, if we look at how BGPLU has been used, that tends to be used in a single operator's network in order to give um, some degree of scale. So you might have a network with, um, you know, core and aggregation and access um, domains, and it might be untenable to put them all into one, um, you know, big IGP. And so what people tend to do is to um, have, um, you know, in some implementations, separate ASs, you know, for each aggregation, you know, each metro, for example, and then um, another AS for the um, core. And then between those ASs, they have um, BGP LU. And so by extension, um, people could use BGP um, CT nowadays instead, but for the same um, overall use case of, um, you know, this large network that's is being um, you know chopped up into these different ASs for scaling reasons, and once they have the BGP CT, they have the color awareness you know between those two domains. That said, from the protocol point of view, there's nothing stopping people using it between real you know separate ASs belonging to um, different companies. It's just something that's um, not happens so much. So certainly, it tends to be you know within one organization that we see these sorts of things used you know more typically. Uh, very good. Um, Julian, again, thank you very much for joining us uh, for um, uh, doing this Q&A. Uh, we have really good questions. Actually, there are more questions. Uh, if you are, you're welcome to answer oh, in the Q&A yep. uh, no ta tab. And uh, uh, with that, again, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Shogin. Thank you, yep. everybody. Mm -hmm.